Hola, y'all. Happy Saturday night. I um, was just inside filming a recipe for this week of Cajun red beans and rice, which we love. It's actually one of my kids. It's Brady's favorite, one of his favorite meals. So today was his last basketball game of the season. They had a tournament and um, I texted him and uh, cause I wasn't able to go um, and I text him and I said, I'm going to make your favorite red beans and rice for lunch tomorrow. He was like, okay. Um, anyway, so I was busy filming that and I finished and I ran out here to come and talk to you guys and to talk to the Lord, of course. Um, and then I was thinking, I think it's so funny that a lot of what I'm bringing to you at the beginning was things that were just really heavy on my heart. Um, and, and they still are, um, some days. Um, but then a lot of the other days this past week have been specifically about things that I've read. And I just think that's kind of funny. I hope that you don't mind because I'm going to talk about, um, something else that I read today. <laughs> and, um, I'm in Exodus, if you can't tell. So, I still need to talk about prayer. And I'm going to do that as well. But I'm going to jump into it. Um, something caught my eye today. So, the children of Israel are in the wilderness. And they've already went in there a good ways. And they've already encountered their first battle. And they've already went without water. And murmured and complained. Whatever. Um, and so I'm a little bit further than that. This is where God decides I'm going to give them quail and I'm going to give them manna. And the scripture I wrote down that stuck out to me about this. Again, it's amazing when you read how you don't see things or you forget them, which is part of my point today. And then when you reread them, you go, wow, I never saw that or whoa. I never looked at it that way. And there's a couple of different reasons. The, the word of God is alive and sharper than any two-edged sword. But also, we when we read God's word, we are seeing it through our eyes at that time. So, in other words, if you're going through, if you're joyful and happy and you read uh, scripture, you view it that way and you see the beauty and the joy in it and all of that. And you should. Then there are times when we read it and we're very sad and we find comfort in there. Comfort that we may not have needed on one of those great days. So we might have missed that in the scripture. But then when we read the same scripture on a day when it's incredibly hard, that is what stands out to us. And I think that's the beauty of God's word and his spirit because the Bible is alive and it speaks to our spirits, the things that we need when we read it. So let me jump into this, this particular verse. And it's in Exodus. Sorry, let me get my phone. Then said the Lord unto Moses. So he's speaking to Moses, of course. Behold, I'm going to rain bread from heaven for you. I'm paraphrasing in my own words. This is King James Version. I'm just going to say it in my words. And the people are going to go out. They're going to gather a certain amount every day. That I may prove them whether in the dark whether they will walk in my law or not okay don't you think that it would make way more sense and how i've always viewed it and how i think most people do god rained manna from heaven to give them food <clears throat> they needed food and that was his solution for it i'm gonna provide I'm going to provide you with some manna every single morning. You don't have to do anything for it. It's going to be there. It's like going to be the like the dew on the ground. You just go out and pick it. And the quail, they're going to come at night. Plenty of meat. Plenty of bread. I just thought God was providing sustenance, bread, and food for his people. And he was. But he clearly says to Moses, let me just say this again. Exodus 16 and 4, if you're curious. He says, I'm going to rain bread from heaven uh, for you. And the people are going to go out and gather 
a certain amount every day that I can prove them and see if they're gonna follow my law. It sounds a lot to me like the test that he gave Abraham. I even wrote that down. It came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham. And he said unto him, Abraham, and Abraham said, yes, Lord, here I am. He said, go to the certain mount at a certain time, certain day, sacrifice your son. Abraham said, yes, sir. Okay. And we know the story. Abraham went all the way through it. He went all the way through with it up until the point where he had to do it. And he was in the process of doing it when God stopped him and said, now I know. In other words, now I know your dedication, your willingness to obey, no matter the cost to you personally. You trust me. You didn't hold back your one and only son, the heir. Now, I know he had other sons, but this was the promise seed. This was the promised child. This one was a miraculous baby. And an angel said, from this child are all the nations. You're going to be blessed out of the, this child. So to go lay that kid on an altar. Matter of fact, I've already done a walk with God about that. So I'm not going to go into that. But it reminded me of that. He wanted to see if they could obey the simplest of commands. And so Moses is like, okay, he goes back to the children of Israel. And this is what he says. God is going to give you, you've been murmuring and complaining. And God is going to give you quail at night. And he's going to give you manna. And he explains, this is the details. It reminds me so much of my classroom and teaching in general, where you give the directions. And I mean, I'm a, an eternal optimist because I always think they'll get it. Everybody will get it. Everybody will get it. I've said the directions three times. I've modeled them. I've written them on the board. They'll get it. Everybody don't get it. And it's a multitude of reasons. One could be, they don't care. Two could be, they weren't listening. Three could be, they didn't hear. And that could be for different reasons. Or they didn't see. Number four, they didn't comprehend or they didn't understand. Okay, but, the and I was talking about my classroom. But this command from God is very basic and straightforward. So he tells them, pick enough manna every day, enough for you to eat. Don't pick too much and don't pick too little. Because I don't want you to hoard it. Because then you would not be relying and depending upon me every day for bread. Because that's what he was training them to do. I'm God. I'm going to take care of you every day. I don't want you to pack this mess in the freezer. I don't want you to go can it. <laughs> I know they probably don't have these materials. But I don't want you to put up for a hard time. Because I am going to take care of you in your hard times. Take no thought. Oh, it reminds me of that. Man, it reminds me of that uh, New Testament scripture. Take no thought about what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to wear. God is going to take care of that. Rely on him. Trust in him. And that's what he was trying to build with the children of Israel. Trust. Dependence on him. He took them. The Bible says when they came out of Egypt... There was a shorter route to the promised land, but he didn't take them that way. He, it says that the Lord led them through the wilderness because he said there was an enemy there. can't remember which group of people it was. I don't know if it's the Amalekites or who it was. And the Lord said, I don't want them to go into battle as soon as they leave bondage because it would be too much for them to immediately go into fighting and they would be disheartened and they would turn around and want to go back to Egypt. He said, I'm not doing that. You can go read it guys. And he says, I'm going to go this way. So he takes them in the wilderness to save them. He wanted to give them some peace. He just got them out of a very abusive, traumatic, torturous situation. The last thing he wanted to do was take his beloved people. He loved them. He did not want to take them into war. He wanted to give them rest. So he takes them in the wilderness. You know, we always think of the wilderness as a bad thing. I got so much coming to my mind. This one may be a little lengthy, but just hear me out. We think of the wilderness as a bad thing. But when Saul Paul had his conversion on the road to Damascus, 
you should go check out the fact that he went three years into the desert alone to be taught by God himself, the scriptures, to be discipled. Go check that out. Before he starts his missionary journeys, before he starts his ministry, before he does anything, after God <clears throat> appears to him on the road to Damascus in the form of flesh, in the form of Jesus Christ, which is his fleshly manifestation, he goes into the wilderness. Go check it out. He goes into the desert, excuse me, but wilderness, desert, tomato, tomato, right? Some good things can happen in the wilderness if you let it. Some good things can happen in the desert if you let it. So he leads him into that place. And he is like, I'm going to take care of you. Just obey. Follow my directions. Here, you don't even have to bake anything. Look, I'm going to give you this manna and the quill. Pick enough. Then he says, you're not allowed to work on the Sabbath. What a gracious, wonderful God that says, I set aside a day for you to rest from all your labor, to enjoy your family, to spend time together, and to not work. He knew it was so important that he demanded it. He commanded it. You don't do any work. He, <laughs> he knows human nature. We're, I mean, we can be workaholics, and I'm guilty of it. And he said, I, it is so important to me that you sit down and you rest with your people and you take a load off because your physical body, your mental and your emotional cannot handle 24 seven and you weren't designed to handle it and God commanded you to rest. You, I'm talking to you. Yes, you, you need a rest. You're supposed to take a day of rest. I need a rest, I have to rest. I am not God and I'm not superhuman, but newsflash, God even rested. On the seventh day, as an example, God rested. He doesn't even need rest. He's like the battery of all batteries. He doesn't even run out ever, and he rested. And he looked at all of his stuff, and he said, it is good. Okay, I'm just entering this for free. Take a break. Take a day. You're supposed to. It is one of the Ten Commandments. Let's follow it. Let's rest. And you know what? Let's do what God did. Let's rest and look all around at everything we've been blessed with and everything we have. And let's say, it is good. It is good. It is good enough. It is sufficient. It is good. And breathe deeply the life that we live because we are so blessed. Okay. Jumped off topic, but I felt that one. So that one's for free. They're all for free. I'm just kidding. We have to rest. So that's his commandment. It's so easy. And he said, okay, on day six, you go and collect enough for you to eat for two days so that you can obey my commandment about the Sabbath. Because there's not going to be any manna on the Sabbath. I'm not raining it down on the Sabbath. So you pick enough on the day before to last you two days. And guess what? It is it is it is so incredibly frustrating to read the scripture sometimes because it's like, oh man, that was an easy command. I mean, there are maybe there are more difficult things to do, but that one would be easy. Go pick your food, pick extra on this one day, so that you don't have to do anything the next day. I got you, Lord. I got you. I can do that. Sign me up. Do you know? Right after that. There were some in the children of Israel that collected more than they could eat in a day, left it in their houses overnight, and they got worms. And it smelled bad, and it rotted, and it stank. Seriously, children of Israel? Seriously? And then, guess what? Sabbath rolls around, the first one. There were people who didn't have enough food and walked down the morning of the Sabbath to go and collect manna, and there was none. Where were these people when Moses was giving them instructions directly from God? 
who? From God. You know, the one that just like made the Red Sea split and you walked in between two walls of water to escape the taskmaster that beat you for over 400 years. That one, that God, that one. Yeah. Moses talked to him and came back to you and said, I'm going to feed you every day and every night. And uh, you don't have to do a thing except obey me and go pick your food up. It's like the biblical, um, you know, it's like drive through. <laughs> it's like, that's all you have to do. Pick up the food, pick up extra on this day. Y'all, they couldn't do it. They didn't do it. And let me tell you what else I said. God gave a simple command that would benefit the children of Israel. This wasn't something that they were going to sacrifice anything. You don't have to do without. This was literally the bread that you didn't have to bake or make. And he said, <sighs> God gave a simple command. This is what I wrote. That would benefit the children of Israel to see if they would obey him and walk in his ways. And they failed that very simple test. How am I going to apply this? I put, obviously, there is something in us because I'm not perfect either. There is something in us that seems to not be able to listen or follow directions. And I want to make sure that I obey even the simplest commandments of God. What is that scripture? He who is faithful in a little will be faithful in a lot. I tell my kids all the time, specifically my oldest. I do. I tell them. Sorry, I had to switch hands. I tell him... Um, the little things matter. What is it? The little foxes that spoil the vines. The little things matter. If you'll be untruthful about something small, you'll lie about something big. God's not interested in just the big things. As a matter of fact, the big things are usually just a ton of little things. So the simplest commands matter because it's just simple obedience, just simple obedience. And I connected it to the scripture about Abraham, and I'm almost done. I've kept you longer than I wanted to. And the last thing I wrote on my journal was how does this connect to the kingdom and the whole body, the whole church. And I put, there are things that God has asked us to do individually. We call those convictions. That's, that's what I call them. That's what my church calls them. Or our belief system, I guess. We call them convictions, personal convictions. Then there are things that he has asked to do, us to do collectively. So as a body, as a whole group, he has asked us to do certain things. Some of those individual convictions are just that. They're individual. They're different for every single person. And they're very personal. And they are truly tailored to individual needs because God knows us individually. And where one person may be able to do something and it'll be okay, another person cannot. Um, because God knows that that would not, it would be detrimental to that person. So those personal convictions are really important, but they're very individual. And we get into trouble when we start trying to shove personal convictions on other people. Because unless the Lord has convicted you or convicted them, of those things that are not for the collective entire body, then we really don't have a right to put that on anybody else. There are some scriptures in the New Testament about that. Um, so we have to be careful of that because we can really harm people. So if, if God, you know, nudges you, I'm trying to, I have a couple of examples, but I'm trying to reach for one that I want to use. Um, all right, here I am with the crazy examples, but I think it's safe to do. <laughs> if God were to nudge me or convict me of eating, I'm trying to think. Uh, well, I'll just go, I'll go really wackadoodle here. If God were to say to me, okay, Jesse, I don't want you to eat chocolate. Okay, to me, you know, he convicted me of chocolate. And no, there's nothing wrong with chocolate. Just don't miss the point. Okay, let's just get the point here. 
God spoke to me and said, I don't want you to eat chocolate anymore. Okay. This is what I see all too often. And I know this does go together because we're talking about simple obedience. Okay. He spoke to me. I'm not supposed to eat chocolate anymore. The problem is <clears throat> a lot of people, once the Lord has checked them in their spirit and told them, I don't want you to do that. They, the people, don't want anybody else to do it because they can't. Don't throw anything at me. It's true. Well, that's just not how it works. Okay, maybe the Lord knows that I would become addicted to chocolate and I wouldn't stop eating it and it would be detrimental to one of my organs that's already weak because I was born with a weak liver or something. It's a crazy example, but the I'm trying to use something that cannot be, I don't want to say anything on here that would have hurt anyone's feelings or offend them in any way. So I'm using chocolate and I'm using the liver. They probably don't have anything to do with each other, but you do get my point. It was for me. I can't go over here and if Sally Sue is eating a chocolate bar and be like, well, I just don't think that's very godly of you to eat that chocolate bar. God told me not to eat chocolate. Well, that's great. That is your personal conviction between you and God. And you better obey it because he is going to require you to obey his voice. But leave Sally Sue alone. She can't have Dr. Pepper, but you can. Maybe God said, Sally Sue, you can't drink Dr. Pepper anymore. And I'm just reaching for food examples because I think they're funny. But you see what I'm saying? But simple obedience will go a long way. So there are things that we have to obey when God whispers them into our spirits. They apply to us. Okay. And then there are things like the Ten Commandments. That's one example. They are collective. They're for everybody. I hope that makes sense. I want to be obedient in the smallest things with something just as small as manna because God did it for their good. He's doing it for your good. He's not withholding something from you just to sit back in heaven and go, hmm, I know she'd love to have chocolate. I think it's funny to watch her suffer. No, there must be something in me that don't need, that doesn't need the chocolate. There's something in it that would be detrimental to my spirit. There's something in it that would be a stumbling block to my walk with God. There is something there. Obviously, I'm not talking about obviously I'm not talking about chocolate anymore. There's something in those personal convictions that God knows that you, you don't need it. It's not in your best interest. And so we listen and we obey. I don't want to be like the, I hate to say it, but the Bible says it. I don't want to be like the rebellious, stiff-necked Israelite. I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to be that way. I don't want to be out on the Sabbath looking for manna. When he clearly said it wasn't going to be there. I'm done. <laughs> I hope you got something out of it. I have so much more on my heart to say, but I'm not holding you longer than this. I hope you have a fantastic Saturday. And let's just listen, trust, and obey.